Okay. So, welcome to the last session, the fourth session number four, standardization of methods and processes. Uh, my name is Maurizio Lanzarini. I am a, full, a professor in computer science at La Sapienza, and I will be chairing these sessions. Can I have the slide? Uh, can I? Ah, okay, great. Uh, so I will be very brief in the introduction. Uh, and uh, so the point, that the context of this session is that uh, uh, ISTAT, as we know, has been carried out a modern modernization program with the aim of improving efficiency in statistical production. And actually standardization is one of the key elements for this purpose, right? And so I, you can imagine that uh, models such uh, generic statistical information model and generic st statistical business process model play a central role in this standardization. And uh, to my understanding, there are three main aspects that, uh, that uh, should be taken into account in this effort. One is uh, metadata standardization and domain modeling. Uh, another one is workflow in the statistical process. And another one is methods and tools for the various phases of the process. We have three uh, central aspects that are actually also discussed in this section. Uh, with regard, so metadata and process modeling will be the focus of the of the presentations. Uh, let me just add a few words on the, no, the uh, domain modeling, because I have been involved in uh, collaboration with ISTAT on this uh, issue, and uh, uh, I understand that uh, uh, ISTAT is uh, pursuing an approach uh, uh, on the on the domain modeling uh, issue based on ontology. So what is the ontology-based uh, data modeling approach? It's the idea of using uh, a representation of the domain, abstract representation of the domain, lo logic-based often, with specific languages and standards to represent the domain. Uh, can, I, can I please have a random one? Uh, and so that this kind of representation, abstract representation can be uh, an important uh, uh, object for interoperability and for documentation on the semantics of the domain. Obviously, this ontology, this representation should be mapped to the real data, and in this case, for example, register-based data. And uh, this uh, is done by using a language, a specific uh, language for expressing mappings between data sources and the ontology so that we can uh, interpret the semantics of the data source uh, in terms of, of the concepts and the relationships uh, uh, represented in the ontology. This is a way in computer science to, to, to carry out data integration. By the way, I, I am a computer scientist and I realize that data integration is a term that is used in different uh, way in a different words. Yesterday we had a, an excellent talk uh, on data integration from the point of view of statistics. Here, data integration is, uh, is a term that I use uh, as a computer scientist, which means you have different uh, representation, different uh, um, semantics for, uh, uh, for the data, for the phenomenon that you are studying, uh, stored in different information systems, and you have to reconcile a representation that is able to uh, really provide a model of your, the semantics of the data. So that's a, a, a different kind of uh, interpretation for the same term. Okay, so uh, this is uh, just uh, you know a, a very brief uh, uh, introduction to the, the problem of domain model. But as I told you in this uh, session, we we uh, can you, you can go on, please. Still, uh, again, again, in this uh, in this talk in this session, we we will focus more on processes. Again, please. And uh, so uh, I want to say that in the advisory uh, committee, we have seen actually many papers dealing with this uh, topic of uh, standardization of processes and also metadata. This is a list of uh, papers that has been discussed, that have been discussed in the, in the, in, in the various years. Uh, for example, on the design and implementation of a generalized process of business statistics, 
then uh, a paper on the Italian Integrated System of Statistical Registers, then uh, uh, a, a new framework for quality assessment of processes based on integrated administrative data, and here the term quality uh, really uh, is a sign of the importance of this uh, uh, notion in, 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 in the standardization effort. Then we also had longitudinal and cross-sectional analysis of data in the integrated system of statistical register. And finally, a recent paper on designing aggregate data as statistical data cubes. So this is just a list of papers that uh, have been discussed in the advisory committee. But I want uh, now to go to the, session, to the talks in the session, and, and therefore we have this program. Uh, first, uh, overview of ISTA activities and open problems by Carlo Vaccari from ISTAT. Then we have metadata for statistical processes on registers, Mauro Scano, ISTAT. We also have an overview of new approaches on the topic by Fabio Ricciato from Eurostat. And we finish with the point of view of the statistical production department by Alessandro Foramundi. Okay, so please, Carlo, the floor is yours. And obviously, we will also end uh, with the floor discussion. Thank you, Maurizio. Um, so, today, we, yesterday and today, we saw many interesting uh, models. Uh, and methods discussed. And now we try to go in the, let's say, in the engine room of ISTAT. No? So we want to uh, go and see how the processes are running. And uh, I will uh, describe the, um, the work of a big working group that involved in the last two years uh, the the methodological department. Uh, so I will start, uh, as Maurizio said, from uh, the standards from GSBPM and GSIM, and uh, <clears throat> we'll see how these models uh, are used in were used in uh, ISTAT modelization process, and uh, and then I, I will just try to describe the work of this working group on standards. Uh, trying to give you an idea of what the working method was, but also uh, what are the outputs that we tried to, to reach. So let's start, uh, as usual, with the standards. These standards, uh, a lot of us are working on these standards since uh, many years. Uh, we worked, uh, I think, uh, since uh, 15 years ago uh, when we started de developing GSBPM. And th these tools are very in interesting because uh, we saw that the national statistical institutes, uh, uh, we have the same process model all over the world. So our work is uh, much standardized. Uh, we often use the same input uh, uh, because we use uh, standard classifications. So we use the same outputs because we produce the same data for international organization. In Europe, uh, moreover, we, uh, we produce data for Eurostat. And so <clears throat> these models were very important because uh, we started using them to compare different uh, institutions at international level. And uh, as we went on working on and using these tools, they became a, a, a strong tool to standardize internally inside our institutions. And uh, for example, in our modernization uh, process, we tried to uh, define the structure of ISTAT following uh, the standards defined by these models. So for example, we tried, uh, we, we created the data collection uh, uh, unit following the data collection phase of GSBPM. We, we already had a data dissemination uh, directorate 
for uh, for the dissemination phase and so on. And um, connected to this was the introduction of a service oriented uh, organization. Uh, in this uh, in this view, all the statistical units request services to to the IT, to data collection, to methodologies, and these units provide services to the statistical units, exactly like in service-oriented architecture in, in IT, we are used to, to design our systems. So this working group involved the big majority of the resources in the methodological department. And uh, we had these uh, goals to develop this uh, catalog of methods, tools, and statistical services. And uh, this is important because we, we tried, uh, maybe for the first time, to give a standard to the global production process of ISTAP. And uh, one of the big uh, problems that we have to address was the, the different uh, languages between uh, statisticians and IT guys. And uh, I think that the documentation is uh, a step that is uh, very important because it's the first step that you that you can start for uh, reaching uh, at the end uh, some sharing of methodologies and tools and a kind of standardization of the processes. Um, we, we use it uh, for this uh, our, uh, our standards. As you can imagine, we use it, uh, the information model of GSIM to describe input and outputs of different uh, phases. And uh, we use the GSBPM to identify the sub-process, uh, describing the process methods, the statistical procedures, but also the IT tools for the specific uh, phase. Uh, we also tried to give a broader view to our uh, friends, uh, statisticians, so verifying all, not only which tools are used, are currently used inside ISTAT, but also which tools are available at international level for, uh, for any specific phase. And uh, the, uh, the work was very interesting. Uh, we were, we, we faced the problems uh, about the jargon, about the terminology used, because uh, uh, often in ISTAT, uh, every small, uh, every survey has its own jargon, and uh, every directorate has its own uh, habits, uh, and uh, it's not always easy to find a common language between uh, different uh, units. And uh, and we had also we we had to to try to find a common detail level for different processes. Also, this was another, uh, another issue and it was not easy to find a common detail level, what, what we usually call granularity in IT. <clears throat> and uh, I want also to underline that this big group, uh, imagine that the group uh, had uh, uh, 10 different uh, subgroups with one group of coordinators uh, of, uh, of the whole activities. And uh, we, we tried also to innovate in this and we, we started with a very, uh, we, we will call it uh, a dialectic method. And so we, we discussed a lot between us and uh, we discussed uh, always uh, take into account the different skills uh, that are present inside the uh, inside, uh, ISTAT and so trying also to, um, to improve the communication between the statistical part and the IT component. And so here we, we wrote 
reported just some of the uh, questions that we used that uh, arose during our discussions. And uh, as you can see, is a continuous uh, question and answer between different roles. And uh, we had also our problems of communication, obviously. But I think that we reached a very interesting result because we, we were able to, to discuss everything together with our colleagues. I want to show you just some examples of the, the visualizations tool that, that we used during our, our work. As you can see, we used the uh, let's say uh, advanced uh, uh, graphical representations uh, to to analyze uh, the GSBPM phases and some process uh, to to show which applications uh, were available for each uh, sub process uh, to verify also in the international uh, framework uh, which are the most active countries and organizations and which are the programming languages used in our uh, community, let's say, international community. And uh, also we use it advanced, uh, let's say advanced, uh, interesting visualization effects also to present the outputs uh, of our uh, work, uh, trying to give, uh, for example, different views uh, of our outcomes, like uh, the view by process level, by sub-process, uh, so the identification of different work packages, uh, the different subgroups of our, uh, of our uh, big group. The group, more or less, uh, was coincident with the directorate, more or less, because all the de methodological department were involved. As you can see, also, we try to, to express uh, relation between uh, the statistical methods and uh, the, the different steps of the process. No? And we tried also to give some flow, the description of some flow. At the end uh, of the process, we, I think we reached a very, very interesting uh, outcomes. For example, we had this common description between different processes. I think it's the first time that we reach this kind of uh, agreement uh, on, uh, on this uh, common uh, description. Uh, this will be very helpful to standardize in the future and to identify best practice between different uh, processes. And uh, we, we now have uh, spreadsheets for many processes, we filled this kind of spreadsheet uh, with uh, a very detailed description. And uh, again, for the first time, we have a formalized documentation uh, that will make it easier to exchange information and to transfer knowledge, for example, to new, new hired people or for people moving from one sector to another. We also use it. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, systems like uh, a wiki uh, to better show and uh, to better spread the this the results of the of our group and uh, and the next steps let's say are first uh, a, a, cat a catalog that will contain all uh, the whole methodological offer uh, to, to the different production sectors of the Institute. Uh, this, uh, all these uh, results are available for, uh, for now only internally in the Institute, but for many of them, uh, they will be, it will be possible to extend to the statistical community also externally. And, uh, and the, the last uh, Im very important uh, result in the future will be uh, a full integration uh, with uh, our uh, IT sector, um, developing a, a kind of repository containing the IT tools and giving uh, to our researchers an environment where they can test and run the different tools available for each single step. 
this is something that we just started to, to define, but I think that is important to have very ambitious goals also for that. And uh, I want to underline again that this is uh, another time that the international standards are very useful to improve communication between different uh, rooms inside ESTAT or different uh, units, you know, because uh, these standards are not only interesting for international comparisons. And uh, finally, uh, as you can see in, uh, in this, uh, this is the list of the authors. As you can see, for two of, uh, two of us, uh, for Stefano that retired last month, and uh, me that I will retire tomorrow. So the, I, we had to put uh, the, the external mail addresses. Anyway, we are available for any kind of uh, questions about it. Thank you. So. Thank you, Carlo. We witnessed your last uh, ISTAT presentation. It was nice. So we move to metadata for statistical processes and registers by Mauro Scano. Thank you very much. Yes, this is a joint work with Monica Scanapieco, but now he's uh, in the Agency of Cybersecurity Nazionale and three other colleagues of mine, Laura Tosco, uh, Adele Bianco and Michele Riccio. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, uh, this kind of talk will be on uh, metadata. It is related to the talk that Carlo just gave because uh, Carlo uh, represented the catalog of methods and uh, as he described in one of his slides, uh, methods have an input where we are going to apply them and produce an output in terms of data and the idea is to manage the metadata of these data in a unified manner and i am happy also to hear from professor lanzarini where i'm still working in the data integration area even if I'm not talking about regular linkage and statistical matching. Thank you very much about this. I don't move <laughs> from my, my topics. And uh, let's go directly to the, uh, the, the talk. The objective of the talk, as I told to you, is uh, to define uh, a conceptual framework for metadata that is uh, useful for representing data in whatever part of the statistical process we are considering them from the beginning when we uh, collect data up to the end when we disseminate data. And uh, uh, so um, in, the, in order to do this, uh, we um, have uh, uh, considered some special elements that uh, professor given that this talk has been already uh, you know this talk this, this topic has been uh, the subject of different uh, presentations in the uh, committee advisory committee we take advantage of all the, the comments that have been given in order to uh, represent them and as a matter of fact one of the key topics uh, is uh, the semantics how to express metadata so that we are going to give uh, the correct meaning to, to data. And this has been given at uh, different aspects of data, both for micro data and for aggregate data. And the objective is to give a unique framework where these two uh, uh, elements uh, can be correctly defined uh, in, uh, in uh, um, um, uh, harmonized way. And consequently, the idea is to have also a hint on how we can uh, produce data and give uh, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, way to uh, uh, reproduce and to compute data also by uh, possible, possible users. But this is another part of the story, but we are going to talk about this later on. Now, right, uh, right now, let's focus just on how to structure and how to, uh, to um, define the framework for metadata. As a matter of fact, the idea of this framework has a lot of side effects which are extremely useful. On the one hand, it allows to have uh, uh, the possibility to verify how metadata 
have been defined, if information on metadata is complete, and how to compare metadata and possibly harmonize them along also the different statistical processes that we have got. This is one of the big objectives that we are trying, trying to do uh, for, uh, um, uh, for metadata managed in our statistical institute. And um, so, uh, how do we um, uh, tackle this kind of problem? First of all, we made reference to a standard which was available uh, and uh, has been developed under the uh, UNEC um, uh, coordination, and it's uh, the Genetic Statistical Information Model, as Carlo already uh, represented before. Uh, why? Because there are other standards that are used, and they are used also in statistical offices like SDMX and so on, but uh, in this case, uh, uh, the uh, uh, element that was uh, a key element here was that uh, the organization of metadata in GCM follows the uh, statistical process. And consequently, it follows also the statistical organization of uh, concepts. For instance, and you can see it in the last line here, there are many concepts like population, unit, variable, data set, data structure, and so on, that are typical of statistics and are actually part of the conceptual organization of GCM, so this is good. But uh, it was not enough for us. Actually, we had to put something else, and this is the semantics I was talking to you before. And in order to do that, uh, a key role has been, has, is played by ontologies that uh, Professor Lenzerini already introduced uh, in his uh, slides at the beginning, that is a conceptual specification of a domain of interest uh, expressed through a formal language, shared and ambiguous. And under this point of view, we took advantage of uh, all the efforts that ISTAT has done at the beginning for representing the uh, domain areas of interest in the different registers that were being developed. And for this reason, we are basing our main, we, we start on this side, even though we want to enlarge the possibility to use this framework also elsewhere. Um, so how this kind of framework is organized we have considered the four main steps, four main layer for, uh, for the production uh, process uh, dealing with this kind of data. At first, we have data in the register. And as I told you, there are already ontology, ontologies representing this kind of, of data. So this is a conceptual, I, I, I minimize in this case the, the effect of ontology, a conceptual repository of all the concepts that are useful, useful to represent uh, for representing the information that is present there. We are not talking about any kind of statistics here at all. There is not a variable or a unit or a population. There are concepts. So if I have the base register of individuals, I have persons, I have households, I have residents, I have a municipality, and all the roles are represented here, and all the, re the relationships are important. So we have not only a vocabulary in a sense with concepts, but also the meaning of the relationship between the concepts is extremely important. So that we can understand also what is the relationship between a person and a household, a person and the municipality and so on. But this is just uh, the first set of concepts that we have got. It's not statistics yet. Statisticians are used to have a data set. And the typical data set where we begin to work on consists of rows that are units in a population. And here we have the first uh, statistical terms, concepts that we are going to use, and variables that uh, are observed on the units of, of our population. So it's the so-called design matrix, the, the matrix of microdata where statistics are then based, on, on which statistics are based. So this is the first semantics that we have been, began to, we, we introduced, how to describe this kind of, uh, of micro data sets in terms of the concepts that were available on the, in the ontology, in the beginning of the ontology. So there is a selection, a so-called query, that we needed to, to perform uh, in order to represent this kind of, of, of data set. And it's just the first step. The objective of a statistician is not just to represent this kind of information, but to, to produce a summary 
of uh, information from this uh, micro data set. So the objective is uh, a, an indicator or an aggregate value that is, has been computed on uh, this data set. And finally, this kind of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, indicator is inserted in a table and uh, compared with many other indicators computed possibly in the same way. So it's, uh, a, it's the objective is to describe the overall set of tables of, of, of data that we have got inside the table. So these are the different metadata that we have got. And we have to, to, to uh, consider all the different steps and the semantics that uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, necessary in order to uh, build uh, this kind of information. Uh, so, as I told you at the beginning, the register data have got the conceptual, the, the set of concepts that are the beginning of our journey in order to produce data. And then we start with a design matrix where we consider the, the first concept that I introduced before. If we have a base register of individuals, we have, for instance, persons, household, enterprise, municipality. Area. And what I do, I, I take just one of them, for instance, household. I say, okay, I want households that are resident. I want households that are resident in uh, Italy. And so a geographic representation at a certain point of time. And so there is a specific uh, time dimension that is fixed and so on and so on. So these elements should be organized. And this is the, the kind of structure that we have considered here. And it's the first kind of, of, of semantics that we have just introduced. There are others also that we have introduced as well. For instance, the other one is about macro data. As a matter of fact, as far as data tables, we always refer to a typical organization of uh, the tables in terms of the measure, of dimensions, uh, and uh, attributes, and so on. But what is a measure here? What is measured inside the tables? On the inside, what is the, it's the, the, the kind of aggregate, the, the, uh, the synthesis of the micro data that we have seen at the beginning. So this kind of synthesis, synthesis can be performed in many different ways. And uh, it, it can consist of just a description of uh, a data set referring to a population. And so we are going to, uh, to specify the, the universe of interest and consequently the population that is attached to them, the variables that, it, that are under study uh, for the analysis, and what kind of a statistical analysis we, we want to, to, to show, to represent in the tables, for instance, the average, the total, or whatever it is. This is just a first, uh, let's say, um, representation of, uh, of uh, um, description of a world in, in, on a population for some variables. But what happens if uh, uh, I want to produce other statistical measures that are typical of a statistical production? For instance, I want to compare something. So I have uh, densities, I have ratios, or uh, I want to compare something over time, and so I have index numbers or other complex elements. So uh, in that case, we have another semantics that we should use. It's not anymore a one based just on a population, one or some variables uh, and uh, an analysis, but it refers to the uh, input that we are going to use in order to define the output that actually we need. And, uh, and so this is the representation we try to represent here. Afterwards, what we are going to do is to introduce everything inside a data table where additional variables are the ones that represent all the different uh, uh, elements that are inserted inside the cells of the data cube itself. So uh, uh, let me go at... Uh, uh, um, at the end of this, uh, of this talk, because this is the representation of, uh, of uh, the workflow that we have done. And according to one of the suggestions that was given to us, we have uh, written down a case study, which is quite detailed, uh, on all the different steps that have been performed uh, for uh, obtaining the different layers. But apart from that, another comment was about uh, representing appropriately uh, this kind of semantics in terms of queries in order to understand if a conceptual framework is uh, complete uh, and, uh, and uh, good enough in order to represent what's going on. So uh, what has been used is the ontology-based data access. 
but as uh, uh, Professor Lanzarini already showed uh, at the beginning, um, uh, maps the ontology with the data. Now, in our case, uh, data consists of metadata, and on their use uh, in uh, and, and, and the use of metadata in the different semantical. Uh, um, uh, uh, constructions that we have identified in the different layers, as uh, in the data, um, uh, in the um, uh, design matrix, uh, or for defining the population, or for defining an indicator, and so on and so on. So uh, these kind of maps uh, have has been have been designed in uh, in in the paper with some examples, not everything, and so that uh, we could try to uh, represent, for instance, what's uh, the uh, what what's uh, uh, one of the concepts in one of the uh, ontologies uh, uh, along the different layers. In this case, the one on microdata that uh, refers to the design matrix and that is based on the use of concepts in the previous, in the, in the, the, the ontology at the beginning that we have at the, in the first stage of our data and in the base registers, for instance, and so that we can took advantage of the conceptual framework that we have got there in order to define the, uh, the, our constructions, our queries. So uh, I want to conclude uh, rapidly about this because uh, as a matter of fact, our feeling is that this conceptual framework can be useful in order to manage the, the uh, uh, organization of metadata for the different steps uh, that uh, of the production process that we have got. And the idea is to use this kind of re representation in a new metadata, metadata system that we want uh, to build with a special emphasis on the part on, on, uh, on uh, um, the representation of the process for registers, which is one of the topic of a new topic that we want to, uh, to consider here. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, in order to link this kind of, of uh, of uh, uh, work with the ideas that were already uh, represented by Carlo in uh, the previous uh, talk, uh, what we need still to do, and this is one of the suggestions that uh, uh, were asked to us by the professors in the committee, was to deal with the problem, what happens uh, according to the kind of data that actually you have got for statistical production. You are representing metadata and so the objective. So we are talking about the analysis on a population for specific variables and so on. But if you have got a sample instead of, of a whole population, then you need to have methods that have to be used in order to, for instance, estimate the average that we want to, want to uh, have. And so there is a link between this world of metadata and the tools that actually need to be used, the, the methods that actually need to be used uh, for uh, data production. This kind of link, as a matter of fact, should be still analyzed, uh, but we are confident that about, with the use of, of this kind of uh, approach, we can have uh, already a, a good organization of information in order to interact with the methods part uh, and uh, to guide also possible users of data in providing their uh, new uh, works if you want. So this is the idea. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Mauro, also for being perfectly on time. So next talk is by Fabio Ricciato. Please. Yes. Are you, yeah, you go, you go there. OK, perfect. Can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, thanks uh, to the organizer, uh, particularly to Orietta for inviting me to intervene in this, um, in this workshop. So I was given two papers to read and the task to comment. Uh, two papers um, are the ones that were presented by uh, Mauro Carlo. Uh, the first paper deals with standardization of methods and process. The second deals with uh, metadata. Uh, but reading the paper, I'm, 
I realized that more than with standardization, the both works refers to the to the representation in a structured and formalized way of methods, of processes, what Professor Lanzarini called before work, workflows, and data or metadata, data structures. So it's more about representation and formalization uh, than standardization. So this is an excerpt from the first paper, right? So I collage from the first paper, not just to prove that I read the paper. Um, so the chapters talk about description of process, collections of methods, documentation of process, uh, aims at taking a picture, a photograph, shooting a photograph, but immediately realize that it, we need maybe a video, not a photograph, because the, the process, the thing that we want to capture is dynamic, is changing. So the discovering that we need something that is not static, we need a dynamic way of representing things. There is a table where at some point um, it mentions some uh, hard doc, hard doc uh, function, our functions. And I guess that in the next version of the work, there will be the function, this function in every cell will have a name, there will be a link to some repository, um, and maybe chain, different functions that one come one after the other will be chained together in an automatized workflow. I also was happy to see that uh, in the graphics, you know, the star, the R star is bigger. <laughs> uh, perhaps if you had included also Excel and Excel macro, this would have been maybe even bigger, sadly. But you know, this is this is the first perception of the first work. When we go to the second work, it's again a formal language. Ontologies are a formal language. I was very happy to see that ontology is a formal language comes immediately after a conceptual framework. So you have to think formally and then encode in a formal way with your thinking. I was very, the second paper compared to the first one is um, much more narrow in scope because capture uh, just metadata has, has, has a more narrow scope, but has much more advanced in what, in, in what it does. It already proposes schema, schematics, proposed uh, there are um, um, representations of data structures that are already uh, prone to be understood by machine. It's a, it's a formal syntax that can be understood by machine. And incidentally, I mentioned in the very conclusion of the paper, it says that one of the many benefits of doing this ontology work, which Mauro just presented, is that it will allow in the future to create to let the user create their own analysis from registers or introduce a new dissemination service. I would like, like to pin this because I will come back to this at the very end of my intervention. So these are the, the things that I, the input <laughs> that I took and uh, I start thinking what, what, what I can say that is not completely obvious and hopefully partially meaningful. You know? And I, I found that these both works hinge at the formalization of three things, you know, process or workflows, as they called, methods, and data or metadata uh, structure. And in my opinion, having a bird's eye ref view and bird's eye reflection on why we have to do this, why we have no choice but doing this, would be also useful to understand in which way we should do doing this. So often clarifying the why also illuminates the how. And I'm attempting to give us humble contributions in this, in this direction. To start with, I would like to take you out of your comfort zone, of your statistical office world, and let's, let's jump jump of what has happened in a completely different environment, completely different context, and namely the car industry. In 15 years, from the from the 60s, uh, from the 50, late, late 60 until the uh, uh, um, beginning of the new millennium. And I'd like to pinpoint these following aspects. First of all, there has been a, an increase in the complexity of the product, the car, and of the process that produce the car. The car, we always call them car, they are recognizable product, so they all have four wheels, but they're much more complex, they have much more components. 
there are much more functions. The assembly of these components has to fulfill much tighter tolerance values. So there's more complexity in the product and in the process that produce the product. In order to cope with this complexity without being overwhelmed, the car industry had to introduce automation. Automation means that the actual doing, the actual making, the execution of the plan uh, that was in the 50, in the 60, done mostly manual, by manual workers, by skilled workers, uh, is, has been increasingly automated, and you see only robots on the right pictures, right? So machines have taken the job of making things, of actuating instructions. Um, but the design of the product, the design of the process, the design of the instructions has not only remained with the humans, but has also grown in complexity. It goes hand in hand with the increase in complexity. More complexity, you need more design, more brain power. And more people had to move from the execution of instructions from the production chain towards the R&D, towards the engineering. Some people remain in production line, right? But with the supervisory, with the supervisory role. So this has happened there. And like with any analogy, we should never fall too much in love with analogy. Analogy are insidious. Uh, there are many ways in which the car industry will not teach anything about official statistics. Dealing with data and information is not uh, the same as dealing with metal and plastics. Well, statistics itself is not an industry. 100% uh, automation is maybe not, not attainable, maybe not even desirable in the field of statistics. And even this distinction between product and process, which is a very basic element in a factory, I don't think it, it we, we might question it in official statistics because at the end of the day we are measuring things and I subscribe to the statement that the ones I hear from my former colleagues that what you measure is defined by how you measure it which introduced some some elements of problematicity in distinguishing product and process but this is not the focus I want to make now I want to say having this caveat that I, 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 we should not overlearn from what has happened in the car industry, perhaps there are some source of inspiration that might be useful for us. The first one is that you respond to increasing complexity with automation, with more automation. Not full automation, but more automation. And this is even more important, more, more relevant as we increase the compl complexity in the future. So we have, I think, is that he's already experience the increase on complexity from going to survey data to register-based data. So we have seen the yesterday, you know, there is an increase in complexity in everything. Imagine how big will be the step if ever, if ever, we move, we bring, bring, bring data into, into official statistic production, not into the playground of experimental statistics, but into, you know, the, into the factory. You have no choice. You, you, in order to make sustainable the, a more complex process, then automate it to the possible extent. Um, second point of inspiration, you will have more work, as happened in the car industry, more people, more brain power will have to move from executing instructions to formulating instructions. Hmm? Methodological development becomes more complex and more challenging. Caveat, when I say methodological development, I refer to the kind of research that in ISTAT is done more, more uh, both, excuse me, in what you call methodology department and what you call thematic research. Huh? I think um, um, Monica, very diplomatically in this introductory speech, mentioned that this thematic research, methodological res research, this is sharp distinction should be maybe le made less sharp, as you say. Very diplomatic way to say that it's all research at the end of the day, right? So I'm referring, when I say methodological development, I refer to both of them. So we will 
the, the machinery of official, stata, of official statistics will see a growth in the complexity of the instructions. Instructions that define methods, that define workflows, and that define data metadata structures. We, you need more human brain to design this instruction, but eventually this instruction will have to be executed by machines, by computers. Um, and then, if, if this will happen, so it's just a matter of how painful will, will be the part to do that. But then there is a paradigm change in the sense that instructions, so we let, that now are written by humans for humans, will have to be increasingly written by humans, always, the methodologist, uh, thematic expert, for machines and for other humans. And <clears throat> And this is an element, a key element, because in the moment where you have to write instructions for machines, you have no choice than using a formal language, a formal and structured way of representing things for the machine. But this has a benefit also for the other humans. So these are the two paradigms. So the old paradigms, if you have a manual production in the car, uh, the, the, some, some humans design instructions and then code it into human readable documents, manuals, guidelines, wiki, uh, for other humans to interpret. And if you take 12 different humans, might interpret in a slightly different way the same instructions if the instructions are produced, are, are encoded in a human uh, readable language. And you might end up with you know, different implementation of the, same, of the same method because the human language is not completely unambiguous. And in the bottom is that you have humans that design methods that eventually have to go, have to be implemented by machines, therefore have to become software, ontologies, uh, database schema, therefore has to be represented in a formal way, a formal and structured way, but then the same formal way of representing will be read, interpreted by humans, by humans that have to improve uh, the methodology, humans that maybe have to import the methodology in another office, humans that have to interpret the final statistical product, so the users, and therefore this becomes a, becomes a um, uh, a description of the process for the users. So there are humans inside the institutions, in other sister institutions, uh, on, on the user side, etc. A humble suggestion that I, I would like to give is that these two paths, you know, the, the documentation, so let's say the, <clears throat> uh, the, the instructions written in human and for humans and those written for, for machines, in my opinion, should be always considered in bundle, in a bundle, should be considered together. You have to optimize the way you represent the workflow, methods, and data structures in a way that is both uh, exposed to be in, compiled, interpreted by computers, but also understood by humans. It's, it's just one task, it's not two tasks, it's one task. And to this end, I might suggest maybe uh, no, the concept from literate programming uh, might be useful. I'm not an expert in uh, uh, software documentation, but I would feel the need to call, talk to a computer scientist or a specialist from this subpart of a computer science to seek for, for, for advice. So what will happen is that we will go from a, from a mostly manual process where you know, the workflow lies mostly at the human level and occasionally the human call a routine, call a macro, calls an R function, but the control of the process remains with the human. So it's like using tools, <laughs> like a driller. We will gradually shift towards an automated workflow where it is the machine runs the workflow and uh, when needed, uh, may, no, it um, it's a interrogates the humans or let the human expert have a, has a checkpoint. You know, analyze if things are going well, supervise, maybe take design decision 
oh, excuse me, uh, execution, in, uh, execute instruction that you were not able to automatize in a formal way because they still um, have to pull uh, non-structured but still precious knowledge from the expert. So uh, the human are not being kicked out in this process. They are just being used where they are mostly useful in the most high level uh, important tasks, not in uploading a, a data set or, or calling two functions that we all be, always be, we call one after the other, right? So this is going from tools to pipelines, to production pipelines, highly automated, perhaps never fully automated, but this is not where we want to, to get. Now, if complexity brings automation, automation brings the softwareization of statistical methods. Softwareization means that more and more uh, the statistical method, the estimators, the workflow has to be translated into, into software. Now, a caveat. None, nothing in my talk is referring to machine learning. Uh, there is a lot of human learning and machine in this talk are only there to execute things that the humans have designed. So just no, don't want to be misunderstood. Um, I'm, I have my own idea on the role of machine learning in statistics. I don't want to touch on this topic, but just you know, keep machine learning outside this set of slides. So softwareization of statistical methodology has a range of implications. And we, each of these implications might be worth a separate workshop. First of all, software quality must become part of methodological quality. If you don't organize your large software system in a way that is highly, that is good, no? you cannot maintain it, you cannot evolve it, you cannot understand it, right? So, so more and more methodology, methodology or thematic research, I don't distinguish them, so for me it's just two different, uh, different skills of the same team, have to seek advice, maybe recruit experts in software, software architecture, software production, or computer scientists uh, that have an, an expertise from that part. Not because they have, because software quality matters. And maybe at some point in one of the next version of the statistical code of practice, maybe software quality will be mentioned there. Second, there is a lot to learn from, from computer scientists that are skilled in developing large software projects, collaborative projects by different people, maybe from different institutions, um, versioning control. So software development practices have something that maybe we methodology should, should learn because more and more your methods will be a complex workflow with many modules. And you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Just go to the university, pick an expert, and, and let him or her advise you on this. Um, one of the advantages of methodology becoming software is that open source code, open source ontologies, open source data structures can be released. And finally, you know, leaving up the promise of methodological transparency that is written in the code of practice more or less, like many things are written in the Italian constitutions, but not yet attained, right? Um, there is a benefit of preferring open source platform and programming languages, which, which we might discuss in another venue. And last but not least, remember the pin from the, from the talk, from the paper by, uh, by Mauro. If uh, you softwareize the methodology, you can also offer new statistical service. Like instead of just disseminating data, make statistical computation service available, which is, you know, what you will have to do that because the user will need that. And if you don't give them to them, they will go to, to your competitors, right? With a loss for, for all the society, not a loss for Istat. Huh? So the softwareization of methodology is, in my opinion, a key term, a key term that I'm striving to introduce in the dialogue, in the discussion also, also in my own institution. Uh, very quickly, because I think I'm consuming my time, already now you can map, you can see code as a process metadata. You know? 
whenever he said, um, whenever you have a method, and the method can be an estimator, can be something numerical method, or can be just a query that selects something, right? You have some input data, and you have some output data that look different. Even just a select uh, SQL is an instruction, is a method that delivers something that is different, of course. Now, you are committed by the statistic code of practice to describe precisely what is the output. In order to describe what is the output, you have no choice that, that um, describing in detail what was the input and what was the process. And what, and what best, what better method than just releasing the open source code uh, or the structure along with the, with the verbose documentation that also explain why you have chosen this method and not another one. Now, this is all very good. Uh, in all this, in another thing that was very clear from the paper is that we are, you are, we are just at the very beginning, at the very beginning of a very important journey, of a very important path. That is the transition from a mostly manual production, statistical production, towards a mostly automated statistical production. We are just at the beginning, especially the, the work that Carlo presented. So we are we are really the first step. But the first step is also the most difficult very often. So I'm saying this with, with pride. The first step has already been taken. This is a good news. The second step will be will be easier. It will be easier if we have our clarity clar if we clarify among ourselves where we are going, what, what is the path, right? Now I think a warning to the innovators, huh? because in every institution, sometimes uh, there is a perception that some people are more conservative, some people are more innovative. I hate this, but I understand that some of us think in this way. And I would like you know, to, to, to issue some caveats to the innovators. Many things can go wrong in, in an pro, innovation process. Huh? I, actually, I don't like the term innovation by itself. I prefer progress right? because innovation that goes in the right direction is process. Innovation can also go in, in wrong directions. Many things can go wrong. I think it's useful to be aware of the things that go wrong. First, uh, one thing often transition go wrong when you just represent and engineer the final state where we want to achieve, but not the transition path. This is a mistake. You have to engineer the final state and the transition path to get there jointly. Second, you have to communicate why it is in everybody's interest to get to that state. Uh, you have to ensure that the promise, for instance, the promise that you know the people will do less boring you know, clicking on Excel file and more interesting development on research uh, on design has to be lived up in a reasonable time. Otherwise, if there is no reward, you know, if, if some people are losing and not gaining some more rewarding task, you will find more resistance. But the most important thing that I would I would warn to myself if I if I had to you know to manage this this transition is that always keep in mind that a good idea, a good concept can always be casted into a bad implementation. And it's your responsibility as innovators, not just to come up with a cool, brilliant idea, which might not be the most difficult part, but also to cast it into a good implementation. Because if you fail the implementation, you pollute the perception of the good idea, right? And uh, maybe some of us have seen this picture up there, you know, where the innovators let's see, uh, see themselves as the cool guy, you know, and the conservatives, you know, the guys, they don't have time to innovate, we are too busy, you know, that's cool. Uh, but there, I, I, I made last time a, a different version where the guys are already, oh, okay, so the design is a bit, so the, the, the guys have already a, a will, a will input, and you are proposing a flat tire. <laughs> so a, 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 a inflatable tire is a good idea, but if the hold, if it's hold, is a bad idea, I prefer to stay <laughs> with, with the old. So the innovators are not cool by themselves. Innovators are only good, good when they are able to cast a good ideas into a good implementation. And I give an example of, of possible bad implementations. 
Having an anthology it was an excellent. I was really happy to see this paper, which is also extremely well written. But in principle, you know, you, you might develop the wrong ontology. <laughs> you might develop an ontology that does not fit the need of the people that are using them. And this is a bad implementation. So you have to ensure that the ontology is developed with them, which by the way is exactly what I saw in the paper. And I'm sure this ontology is the right one. But if you are not afraid that your ontology is the wrong one, it's more likely that you take the wrong one. So you, you have to be afraid of making mistakes in order to be cautious. So, so we don't need just an ontology. We, just, we need a good ontology that immediately help the people that are working and recompensate for the learning process that they had to understand you know, what an ontology is and how to write in a formal way. Standardization based on the international standard is a good idea, right? But are we really sure that GCM and GSBPM, which are, of course, were developed for survey data, do they really fit for the purpose of registered data? And do they fit for big data? We have to ask the question. So it's not up to me to answer the question, but I'm here to ask the question. You know, just incidentally, I know that GSBPM is not the fourth holy books after the Torah, the Bible, uh, and the Quran. It could be questioned. So we need international standard. Whether it's a GSBPM or something else that we need to develop, that's, uh, that's, that, that's a question to be asked. Of course, I'm a big fan of open source tools. Uh, I would like that we see more open source tools, but those that push for open source tools have to avoid the mistake of pushing for a, a buggy open source or open, open source tool that is not mature enough. And therefore, when you try to use it, you say, ah, I better go back to the SaaS. Right. So these are the warning to the innovators. And with this, I'm conclude. Thanks. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Fabio, also for pointing out that computer science is not only machine learning. Please. Okay, okay so Alessandro will give the final talk of the yeah, session. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to to be here to represent uh, the point of view of the statistical uh, production. In uh, in this presentation, uh, I first of all I begin from uh, organizational context and uh, the relationship between uh, a, a new organizational context and the um, statistical processes and the harmonization and standardization. So uh, then uh, I, I, I will see the main element of standardization and harmonization processes uh, useful in the statistical production uh, sense. And uh, at the end, uh, I will try to, to sum uh, uh, the first uh, uh, conclusions. So, about uh, organizational context, uh, in uh, 2016, ISTAT has begun a modernization program as a strategy to improve the production of a current statistic uh, moving from a traditional model based on the vertical integration of statistical processes to a generalized model composed of a set of a common and shared infrastructure. All uh, these infrastructure are based on the centralization of support services uh, with the activation <coughs> sorry, of supply demand uh, mechanism. Uh, within this modernization prog program was a reform in the organizational structure uh, with the separation between a production department and a support department. This implies, obviously, among other things, that efficiency in statistical processes derives from uh, successful communication collaboration between these uh, two areas. 
to have uh, uh, organizational uh, framework uh, to be efficient and uh, functional, the, the timing of the demand and supply services must be clearly defined, as well as the, the procedure for proposing services. It would be useful to have a system where supply and demand for services can be consulted in real time. In order to have a fully sustainable system, I mean that it would, it would be necessary to reduce uh, the planning time of the supply demand mechanism. And uh, a possible solution could be to differentiate between current processes, current production, and new uh, production, innovative production. And about current processes, about current production, the definition of services should be defined, I think, only the first time, and use this planning also in subsequent years. For instance, uh, about uh, the survey on small and medium enterprises, uh, I think that, uh, that we have been carrying out for many years, it would be useful to define the standard process and uh, uh, related services, I think that only the first time, and, uh, and then repeat it the following years without uh, foreseeing uh, further requests for uh, services, unless uh, there are uh, innovation. Uh, in this way, I think that we can reduce the uh, planning activity, I think then 10%, because 90% is current production. And I, I think that it is very important for our uh, model approach. So, um, obviously, in this organizational context, harmonization and standardization of processes become a crucial point to avoid redundancies and inefficiencies in statistical production. In particular, the lack of harmonization and standardization involves duplication in solution and limited possibility to make methodological and technological innovations. So, what should be the main element I think that we have the approach based on harmonization and standardization of processes. First of all, applicability. Not only uh, we have to consider only the traditional production processes, such as surveys, but also integrated register system, censuses, integration, among register and surveys, integration between multiple sources, as national account, for instance, and other uh, statistical production, for example, composite indicators and so on. Sharing the statistical processes and, the, and therefore the breakdown in processes and sub-processes must be built together between expert of support services, in this case, methodological expert, and thematic experts. Since only from the, the synergy of the two component is it's possible to fully define in the correct way all the phases. Clarity, it's essential to articulate processes and sub-processes in a clear and simple way to avoid error of allocation and therefore of processes definition. For this reason, it's essential to have a common uh, language, a common vocabulary, and uh, subsequential of this is the training. Uh, it is important because uh, it's concerned to acquire a common vocabulary 
and it is essential to share knowledge and basic term terminology. In this sense, even a contamination of knowledge is certainly useful, both for support services expert, both for example, for methodology expert, to know basic element of a production, and then is useful for us, it means that for thematic expert, to have knowledge of support services. And at the end, completeness. It's essential not to have a rigid tool, but uh, able to take into account the diversity of the processes. It's visible uh, to offer services that have standard characteristics, is important, harmonized as much as possible, but which are able to respond to the specificities of the processes. For example, the processes of structural business statistics have some peculiarities with respect to the short-term statistics and vice versa. It's not possible to have the same uh, tool and the same standard uh, services. So, uh, first uh, conclusions. First of all, effic efficiency in statistical processes in ISTAT derives from successful communication collaboration between a production department and support department. This can be easily achieved if the services offered by support team are clearly expressed and are supported by tools that implement high standard methodologies for each step of the production process. Second, it's it's uh, fundamental involve all support services, not only methodologies uh, directorate. Uh, it means that uh, IT uh, uh, dissemination, uh, data collection, and so on. All directorate have to consider the same approach, the same model. <coughs> Could be GSBPM, I don't know, but it's important to have the same approach, not only one directorate, one support services. So none of such new development, I, I think that can be successfully achieved without a fully involvement of the production sector. This involvement should really take place from the initial <coughs> stage, since there may be specificity that must be understood right away. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Alessandro. So it's now time to open the discussion. We have uh, 10 minutes for this. Pierre, and then... Yes, uh, I would like to come back to, uh, actually, the talks were really great, and I think you, you, you attacked something that you see we need to do, of course, you see, having those uh, standardized procedures and so on, like in a, because you see, you cannot work in stove pipes like, uh, like this, and I totally agree on this. But uh, I'll talk to you a bit of my experience that I have in a former life. Uh, just to say that, you see, when you say collaboration is important, I totally agree. Uh, but, and maybe, uh, and this is what my question will be. Uh, you see, within ESTAT, are you not having what they call passive resistance in the sense that these guys are listening to you? For example, you see, you have a, a person in charge of a project uh, or a survey or producing statistics on such subject. And then you say, okay, we will harmonize the system, we'll have a better system, we'll put this, we'll replace yours that you have there and so on. And these guys are looking at you, oh, yes, right, thank you. And okay, and but go back to work. We will continue to make our stuff. And why they would do right to do this? Because they don't like to lose control. Because at the end, these guys that are managing their surveys need to respond to the public after when the statistics are out. And if they cannot explain why 
this thing occur or this thing occur, or analyze properly the thing, they will be very reluctant in order to change to new things. So this collaboration is essential, but I'm really puzzled or curious to see how within ESTAT you are able to do so while it's not something that is granted at the start. Second thing, you talk, we talk about standardization, and this, then you say, uh, standardization implies innovation. This is almost paradoxical, okay? And I will tell you why. Because, you see, you have standardization. You say, okay, let us go with these, this big uh, new system that we, uh, it's really up to date, it's really the, the, the big thing. Most of these systems, most of the time, they took time to develop. The, a lot of effort have been put there and so on, and these systems are used. Now, and it has, this subject has been touched by another, uh, uh, yes, I, by uh, Mr. Faramondi, yes. Uh, you see, look, there are some guys that are there, yes, but for our particular survey, we cannot use this system. Or, and sometimes the, the, the tendency is to say, oh no, you will fit in this. And then the survey is not working well anymore because you need to fit within the, uh, the thing. Because, uh, so the forcing the people to be fitting in the mold, then you have a problem. Now, these guys, sometimes these guys, they say, yeah, oh, we're thinking about this new method. I say, look, no, mm -mm -mm, we cannot go with this new method because we already put too much money in the big system that we just built. So again, innovation is cut or stopped because of the fact that so much is put into those generalized system or super system that are there within the office. So you say that it's essential not to be rigid or to have rigid tools, but how can we have non-rigid tools when these tools are so large or so complicated or so like uh, so much uh, expensive to develop. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, let, let, let's wait for the second question. Thank you very much for this really interesting and entertaining session. And I have uh, one more detailed question and two remarks. The first is uh, regards standardization. So my question is, uh, do you, st you standardize variables that this I understood on the basis of GSIM, but do you as well standardize value in a sense that, for instance, for sex, male is always one, female is two, and so on. So is this standardization process going in that way because it might be cumbersome then to, to recode and, and so on? Okay, that's the detailed questions. The remark are to two issues, uh, Fabio, had in his talk. The first one is quality of software and the code of practice. I am a little bit uh, skeptical it will make it in the indicators, but for sure a place could be the so-called quality assurance framework, which is behind the code and which is a living document. And it should, in my opinion, live far more than it does in reality. So this is, would be a good place. The other thing is this uh, GSPPM and GSIM, the very question, are these the right things? I think as well here, it is very important to keep in touch uh, with the governance of the modernization group and so on, and really to, to strive here for continuous improvement. There are other things as well, not only this, these things, but uh, geocoding and, and, and so on, which should be included. Okay, that's my thing. Okay, I think last question and then we have... Uh... The answer? Uh, you. <laughs> no. Uh, I found the Richard talks uh, talk critical, very interesting, because it shows the usefulness of aspect that seeing from outside seem a bit obscure, like GSBPM, GSIM and ontology expert on these issues look look like strange pri uh, price of obscure practices. It's very difficult to the communication with uh, uh, an expert of GSIM, GSBPM. 
uh, one doesn't understand what they want and why they want that. And that this is a strong barrier to the application, the uh, real application in current uh, statistical processes. The example of the automobile, uh, of the automotive uh, industry is uh, essential. It, it shows where we want to go and enables different experts to collaborate, decreasing the fear of difference and loss of autonomy. Integration of different culture and skills, sharing the same vision where to go, it's a key element for the success of progress. Okay, thanks. So, Carlo, do you want to answer to the first? I try to give uh, some short, uh, not, not answers, but just some hints. Um, about the, the, the first question, um, I, I understand that from uh, the external point of view, sometimes uh, these activities can uh, seem like uh, um, useless uh, no, compared to the process. But I, I am sure that uh, also for uh, external stakeholders, uh, uh, the, the standardization process uh, can give uh, huge benefits uh, in terms of transparency, in terms of uh, clarity in comprehension, understanding of the, the real processes. I think this is uh, one of the most important uh, changes uh, recently, in, uh, I think, in NSIs, because uh, now we are more and more interested in uh, sharing with the stakeholders, with the external, everything. So also our methodologies must be transparent, but also our way of working, the internal, the, the engine room, how it works. And if I can just one, I like it a lot, the, the, the Fabio proposal, let's say, you know, it's not a, a coincidence that two weeks ago we were in Geneva talking about robotic uh, process automation for statisticians. And I think that the, what you suggested exactly followed what we have done in our work group. You know, in our work group, we started from more or less uh, free form uh, spreadsheets, then we went uh, to wikis, then we went to, to database, and then we want to go to an environment. You know? So I think that the, the tendency is clear, this one. Thank you. Alessandro, do you want to add? About the uh, first question, um, I mean that collaboration uh, in the, our uh, institute is very is very important, be, especially uh, uh, if we consider the uh, support services that have some specificities uh, in uh, competence and uh, thematic expert, and we can integrate our competence to uh, to define a correct standard process but uh, i agree that uh, uh, flexibility is uh, uh, is very important to to define all uh, standard processes because i, I i'm not sure that uh, all tools are useful for uh, all uh, situation, even if we consider the similar uh, processes like uh, uh, surveys, uh, because uh, we have seen that uh, there are uh, surveys with some particular implications and small difference, but in the statistical production are important take in account and uh, I think it is useful uh, to underline this, not uh, uh, hard standard but uh, 
flexibility is very important for us. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mauro, do you want to answer the second question? Okay, just uh, a few uh, thanks for all the comments that I have uh, heard today. They are extremely useful. Now, um, as far as uh, my um, um, uh, rejoinder is, is uh, concerned, I, I would like to focus on uh, on some aspects. First of all, uh, I would underline that there is, possibly this has not been discussed a lot, of, there is a, a kind of resistance uh, to uh, to standardization, this is to, especially to changing the whole habit that uh, people uh, used to have. So uh, there, there, is a, there is a cost in, in trying to standardize it, but uh, uh, it is also inevitable to do that because, uh, you know, uh, here in East Tennessee, in the last 10 years possibly, we used to be 2,500, now we are less than 1,800, and the, the things to do are many, and the, the, the approaches are quite traditional, still, oh, we try to do a lot of innovations and so on, so right now there are bottlenecks, <laughs> and, uh, and so standardization helps in this, and uh, one of the activities that, for instance, uh, uh, was performed in a uh, group on uh, on standard methods uh, that also Carlo presented, is also uh, to show how difficult sometimes is uh, the preparation of data for the different methodological steps that are performed in the data production process. And this is a kind of specialization, let's say, that, that is typical to every step of a data production process that we have got. And is it possible to, for instance, allow these kind of steps less heavier than today, and so to make smoother the data production process itself. And, and, uh, and in this, under this point of view, standardization is a key, has a key role, in my opinion. So it is important to underline this. Um, and just a few comments on ontologies, if they are fit for purpose. I would say yes, and especially now, that we are having in uh, in the last months uh, a very big experience with many uh, many um, uh, public institutions that are not statisticians, so they are, and where uh, ontologies on the definition on how uh, the, 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 uh, the, the the data in a public administration is going to be produced and shared and so on. Is, is really a very big task that we are trying to do that and there is people here that is working hard on this job and anyway everyone agrees that ontologies is going to give a very big benefit. It's not easy because it's sometimes the ontology comes out of the blue because no one knows it but after that they realize uh, how useful they are. Um, even in a context where no, no one has just that. Uh, no religion, mm -hmm. let's say, in, uh, in, uh, for standardization. So, luckily enough, uh, GSIM, GSB, BPM are not uh, uh, Bibles or whatever. And, uh, and given, given that we are going to change, we, we are proposing additional elements on that. And so, we, 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 we want to use as much as possible the standard elements, but concepts that are defined, but sometimes we need something else. And uh, as far as the question of standardization, let's say we, we are going to have at first a definition of a general model, general conceptualization. So it is important to have the same definition of what a population of the universe of the variable is and so on. And that's then there is something that is pointing directly to the uh, uh, to the um, uh, more uh, practical elements that you are going to implement every day in your life. Under this point of view, we we did a lot of work on, on some this fact. On the one hand, ontologies helped a lot, of, when, because uh, you are going to have a lot of people working in four re registries that ca are coming from different parts, different data production pipelines, and so this helps in com in uh, comparing the different possible uses of metadata and how to have a unique representation of metadata for representing data. And uh, apart from that, we, we actually uh, put around the table the data producer that used to have uh, 
different and independent production pipelines using metadata of their own. And it was good to see uh, their, their reaction in the use of metadata, but others, uh, other data production processes, and how they could be uh, actually reconciled. And uh, reconciliation has been uh, a, a good element. We, we call, the, for instance, this kind of classification the standard ones for us, the ones that actually are going to, to uh, also um, fill in uh, the, the uh, elements we have got in the registry. Okay, there are other things, but thank you very much for your attention. Fabio? Okay, so I'll try to be quick because we're running out of time. So to answer Thomas, uh, whether the so quality assurance framework or the statistical code of practice that needs to be updated. So first of all, it's, I'm not qualified to express the institutional official view of Eurostat. It's, um, it's, I'm, not, I'm not entitled to do so, but to the extent that civil servants are not forbidden to have a personal opinion, my personal opinion is that both have to be upgraded. And it's also, I mean, now you are change, we are trying to change the statistical legislation with the 223 revision of 223-2009 to make an enabler for privately held data. It would be really curious if you change primary legislation and you don't change the secondary legislation. So certain things will have to go in the, so I have no doubt that at some point the, the, the both quality assurance framework and statistical code of practice have to be upgraded. My wish is that you know, software quality makes it into a quality assurance framework and a stronger push towards methodological transparency and the word reproducibility uh, makes into the statistical code of practice. It's a wish. Let's see if my colleagues who are entitled to have an official position on that, uh, what, what they think. Then I will, just to save time, I do a combined answer to Piero, who was mentioning correctly the importance of integration of culture and skills. That's great. We, have, we are not integrating only data, as the talk to of David yesterday, but the real challenge and the real value is in integrating culture, culture and skills. Yes, this has a cost which appear to be high until you understand and you see what is the cost of not doing that. It's like with innovation. Innovation has a cost. Uh, one of the many tricks to make good innovation happen, good so progress, not innovation happen, is, is to expose what are the costs of not doing that, right? Uh, Carlos said, yeah, so uh, you mentioned this talk at Geneva in, uh, in Geneva, uh, which I did not attend, I have to admit. Who, who gave this talk on automation? In Geneva, at, at, at UNIC workshop, uh, we had uh, uh, one of the proposals was the robotic process. Ah, great. Uh, yes. So I, I, I did not know that. So I, now I will go to interest with that. But you mentioned something clear. You say the path, the direction is clear. The direction is clear. We, there is no, yes. It's very important, in my opinion, in an institution like this one, to ensure the direction is clear to everybody. <laughs> it's clear to whom, right? So I think as we have to move a complex machine with people, and some people will have to move away from their comfort zone. Some people are afraid of losing control. The, the, the number one lesson to have this happen is to share the goals and the motivation. Show them the big picture. Show them why this effort in understanding, in, in, in learning a little bit of ontology syntax is part of a bigger picture that at the end of the day will benefit uh, the institution. And then, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> some people are afraid of losing control. So first of all, if somebody, if I propose something and somebody is resistant, I would like really to understand, maybe he, he or she might have a good argument why she's resistant. Maybe she's seeing an aspect of the problem that I have missed. So it's not an enemy, right? To the extent that uh, these um, resistance, these, um, uh, these arguments are uh, a, a declared explicitly, and we have to be sure that we speak the same language, because maybe I mean something, which is good, and he or she means something else, as a language, right? But to the, we should give the possibility to these, um, let's say, um, arguments to, to be considered, now, to be considered. 
y empezamos them they point to things that we should do differently we should better etc so i i you know when you drive the car the accelerator and the brake are both part of the driving it's not one against the other they are both in the same car and, and, and have to work there Losing, so if losing control means that I'm so afraid that the innovators have not really well thought where we have to go, <laughs> losing control, we don't want to lose control. So the right to fail, that is a key essence in innovation, has to be scoped. Each project and single activity has the right to fail, otherwise there is no innovation. But the institution as a whole does not have the right to fail. ISTA does not have the right to fail. A startup company has the right to fail because it's just a project in a bigger venture capital portfolio, right? So is that is like, is the venture capital is the homologous of the venture capital uh, portfolio? So some um, gray, taking grain of salt of salt with grain of salt the proposal of the innovators I think uh, makes sense to the extent that we all share the same view, and you convince that no the that this is, this is where we have to go. There is no choice about it. Then even those that will might locally lose something from their comfort zone, at least we'll see that they are compensating by a more positive environment, a collective good at the institutional level. If they don't see this, you cannot always blame them because they are blind. Maybe you did not communicate this in an institutional level in the right way. And communication at the institutional level is a key element of innovation or process or progress. Thank you. And thank you for your attention. The session ends here. And let us thank again the speaker. Thank you very much. I think it's a closing session now. Okay, so the, in the agenda we have the closing speech from uh, uh, Linda Laura Sabatini, the head of Department for Development of Methods and Technologies for Production and Dissemination of Statistical Information. I have read, of course, because I don't... <laughs> Uh, okay, unfortunately, Director Sabadini cannot be here with us this morning because of unexpected uh, institutional uh, duty. So uh, she apologizes for this. But, uh, however, she had the possibility to prepare a video message with uh, her greetings and uh, a message for all of us. So, uh, please, uh, if the Technical staff could uh, start the video. It's time to close this uh, first ISTAT workshop on uh, methodologics in uh, official statistics. As you know, uh, the ISTAT commitment to quality made us uh, develop this workshop. As a producer of official statistics data, is that needs data of good overall quality. Research on methods in official statistics is a fundamental aspect uh, and a fundamental asset for ensuring always the best methods and hence high level of quality in the different data production context. My personal opinion is that this event has been a success. The market of ideas that is typical of uh, workshops has been extremely live and with important feedbacks on the development of new methods and for their implementation in the current statistical production. For instance, the goal of the permanent census, the focus of the first session, is 
to produce annual data replacing the previous decennial cycle, using information from administrative sources integrated with sample surveys information. The new census strategy is planned to allow a significant reduction of the cost of the census, of respondent burden, and of the organizational impact on municipalities. This objective asked for the development of new methods and tools to be used in order to sustain the world production pipeline. Furthermore, register the topic of the second session are having a central part in the ISTAT data production processes. Anyway, registers have often to face the problem of uh, dealing with multiple sources of information on the variable of interest. What source should be preferred? What is the associated quality framework? What happens if one of the sources has a non-probabilistic nature? This last aspect has been the core problem tackled in the masterclass provided by Professor David uh, Aziza of the University of Ottawa, who I would like to thank a lot for his clarity and for suggesting us so many lines along which research could be pursued. The use of non-probabilistic samples naturally leads to the increasing role of big data and the search of trusted smart statistics, a topic of the third session. The usual statistical framework has to be completely revised. The attention of National Statistical Institute to include these sorts of data among those useful for the production of official statistics can only be motivated by a clear analysis of the overall quality of the results obtainable in this context. Finally, the last session was devoted on standardization. This context is of fixed interest because this area is in between different topics, statistics, data science, and semantics. It touches the areas of methods with their documentation and implementation, as well as the area of metadata, with the effort to make metadata coherent along a process between the processes and internationally for easy data exchanges and comparison. The wish I would like to send to all of you is that this first workshop doesn't stop today. On one hand, it is important that this meeting will be renewed in the next years, starting from these two days' experience. It would now be important to open the next workshop to talks about methods in official statistics developed elsewhere in the world by means uh, of an open call for papers. It's a time for this workshop to grow up. Secondly, I truly wish that the, the workshop occasion could foster possible cooperations devoted to research in the area of statistical methodology. Thirdly, I truly wish 
that the cooperation between research in the area of statistical methodology and statistical production in ISTAT becomes closer. As a last message, I would like to thank the advisory committee on statistical methods that acted as program committee of the workshop. My gratitude is also for having served in the last three years in the committee. Some of you have been working in the committee since 2017. Your help in making research uh, work in ISTAT aligned to the state of current research in statistics has been greatly appreciated. I would like also to thank the invited discussant for the very interesting comments and remarks. Their suggestion and comments will be a motivating driver for making research more and more prominent in our institute and effective for data production. Uh, thank you very much and let's go to the second international workshop on uh, methodological aspect. Thank you.